Let's get into our practice question. We've got a 76-year-old white female with no past medical history coming into the emergency department, brought in by family for, quote, not acting herself. On exam, she's confused, uncooperative, agitated, and appears to be responding to internal stimuli. A urinalysis reveals large leukocyte esterase, pyuria, and nitrites. She admits to visual hallucinations and displays very disorganized thinking. There is a family history of bipolar disorder. The patient is given risperidone in the ED. Which of the following neurotransmitters is primarily responsible for the presentation seen in this case? So pause the video if you would like some time to think about it personally before I walk you through it and guide you in terms of how you should approach this question. So if you're ready, here we go. So I've highlighted in red what you should pay close attention to. She's confused, uncooperative, agitated, and appears to be responding to internal stimuli. Whenever you get this, which is termed altered mental status, you need to start to think to yourself, why is this patient altered? Because the differential diagnosis for altered mental status is really huge, right? It could be anything neurological, anything psychiatric. It could be endocrine. It could be really anything. So we got to start to limit and, and narrow our differential based on what else is in the vignette. Then you see that the urinalysis reveals large leukocyte esterase, pyuria, and nitrites. So now we're getting a little bit closer. We've got some basis for why this patient might be altered. It's very clear that she has a urinary tract infection. And there's some other clues in this question that should point you in the direction of the actual disease process that we're seeing. So I'm going to tell you what's actually going on here, and that still won't even necessarily give away the correct answer. But this patient is delirious. The reason that she has delirium is that she has altered mental status, and the only evidence that the question gives us is that this must be due to a urinary tract infection. The other things that argue in favor of delirium is the visual hallucinations. So if this was something like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder with psychotic features, we would expect to see auditory hallucinations as the predominant perceptual disturbance. But when it's only visual hallucinations, that should make you think more of a medical or neurological cause of the symptoms, not a psychiatric cause. So she's got visual hallucinations, clear evidence of a urinary tract infection. There's no statement that she has something like schizophrenia or bipolar. In fact, the question tells you that she has no past medical history. So this isn't even somebody who's who has schizophrenia and is poorly controlled. She's got no past medical history. Additionally, she's 76 years old. And you should know that elderly patients are very at risk of developing delirium if they have any kind of acute insult. And that could be things like a urinary tract infection, a respiratory infection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the fact that the question tells you that there's a family history of bipolar disorder is there to be a distractor and throw you off and make you doubt that it's delirium and make you question yourself to possibly pick the wrong answer. So now that you know what's going on here, you're thinking like a very high yield thinking clinician. You, you know that this patient has altered mental status. The evidence is arguing in favor of delirium due to a urinary tract infection. Now we need to answer the question, which of the following neurotransmitters is primarily responsible for the presentation in this case? Now, the correct answer here is actually D, acetylcholine. And this is a really tricky question, but nonetheless, very high yield. Most people, when they look at this question, are going to pick dopamine. They're going to either think that it's a primary psychotic disturbance, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, or they're going to know that it's delirium, but still not know the pathophysiology of delirium and just assume that it's dopamine because all you hear about in your question banks and in first aid is dopamine. Dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Everybody thinks that if you have hallucinations, the neurotransmitter involved is dopamine. And oftentimes that's absolutely correct. But in the case of delirium, it's acetylcholine. So I'm going to go through and tell you why A, B, C, and E are incorrect and what they probably refer to as far as pathophysiology of altered mental status would go. Serotonin is implicated in depression. There's also norepinephrine in depression, but it's mostly serotonin. For norepinephrine, norepinephrine and acetylcholine together, so if the answer choice was norepinephrine and acetylcholine, that would be for dementia. 
Dopamine is your primary psychotic disorders that you all know very, very well. So remember all of, you know, dopamine is involved in hallucinations, disorganized thinking, the symptoms of psychosis, right? Acetylcholine, we said, is by itself delirium, but with norepinephrine involved in dementia. And then glutamate is probably beyond the scope of this video, but I'll just mention it briefly. It's implicated in post-traumatic stress disorder. So the point of this question is to make you start to think when you see altered mental status, what's on my differential? Is this delirium? Is this a psychotic disorder? Is this dementia? Or is it something else? And to help you organize your, your line of thinking and to make you really approach these questions from a high yield lens, I've made this table for you. Across the top, we're gonna differentiate delirium, primary psychotic disorders, and dementia. And specifically, we're gonna talk about a few domains, and they're gonna be the primary neurotransmitter involved, which we've already spoken about, but I'll, I'll state it again. The onset, the symptoms, the change or lack thereof of a patient's orientation, their vitals, and the treatment. So again, for the neurotransmitters, delirium is acetylcholine, primary psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, they're all going to be dopamine. And dementia is a combination of acetylcholine mostly and a little bit of norepinephrine. Now the onset here is going to help you differentiate big time because delirium is acute. It's rapidly fluctuating changes in consciousness. So if a patient gets a urinary tract infection, maybe they're normal one minute and the next they're hallucinating, they're disorganized, they're yelling, they're walking around naked, right? It's an acute rapid change in their behavior. The primary psychotic disorders and dementia are both insidious onsets. So they take time to develop. You don't just get dementia. You don't just get schizophrenia. There's slow prodromal symptoms and signs that you see over time. As far as symptoms go for delirium, know that prominent visual hallucinations is usually pointing you in the direction of delirium. But in your psychotic disorders and dementia, these tend to be disease specific and could involve a whole array of symptoms. Orientation, what that refers to is whether or not the patient is oriented. So theoretically, you would ask them, where are you? What year is it? What kind of place is this? What's your name? Who's the president? Questions like that. And if they're disoriented and can't answer those questions, you know that you've got some acute altered mental status. And in delirium, they're disoriented. But in dementia, and usually in primary psychotic disorders, they tend to maintain their orientation. So, you know, if you know anybody who has dementia, maybe think about a grandparent, even though they're confused and have problems with short-term memory, oftentimes they can tell you where they are, they can tell you their name, they can tell you what year it is, sometimes, and they don't tend to lose that orientation until they're very late in the disease. But in delirium, they lose it, right? They're acutely insulted by this delirious onset of symptoms. Now, vitals slash labs. Delirium, it's going to be abnormal. Delirium can be caused by anything. You can be anemic. You can have an infection. You could have an underlying disease or an acute insult like an MI or acute hypoxic respiratory failure. It doesn't matter. Anything that alters the normal homeostasis of the body can cause delirium. Medications can cause it. Autoimmune diseases can cause it. So because of that, it's usually going to have abnormal vitals and abnormal labs. So keep that in mind. Your primary psychotic disorders and dementia, there's really no reason for those labs and those vital signs to be abnormal unless the patient also has something else going on. As far as treatment goes for delirium, the answer is always treat the underlying condition. So in this example that I gave you, in the vignette, it told you that the patient had a urinary tract infection, so we would give antibiotics. The other thing that you want to do is reorient the patient. So make sure that they're, they know what day it is, you know, write things on the wall, such as what day it is, what time it is, put pictures of family in the room to remind them who they are and what's going on. The other thing that you want to do is limit the light from screens. So no phones, tablets, laptops, that's all bad. Make sure that they're sleeping at night and awake during the day optimize their circadian rhythm. So these are all reorientation strategies to help their brain remember where they are, who they are, and you know why they're there. And then lastly, if all else fails, you give low dose antipsychotics. In primary psychotic disorders, you give antipsychotics, and in dementia, you give acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So this table 
is the broad summary of the difference between delirium, psychotic disorders, and dementia. Remember, acetylcholine for delirium, dopamine for psychotic disorders, and for dementia, it's a combination of acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Let's conclude by just briefly talking about delirium, and some of these things will be high-yield tidbits that maybe will help you get questions right on your exam. So again, the causes of delirium are literally everything. Literally everything. It can be drugs, infections, temporary states, abnormalities on labs, anything. You stub your damn toe, you can get delirium. So the treatment is treat the underlying condition and then use these reorientation strategies. The pathophysiology here is an alteration of acetylcholine and it's specifically due to abnormalities in the reticular activating system. So you have this area in the brain and it's the reticular formation, also known as the reticular activating system. And what it does is it takes sensory input from cortical structures in the brain and basically integrates them in the brainstem and the spinal cord with your various cranial nerves and all of your output signals from the brain. So in essence, what it's doing is it's taking in all these signals from the sensory areas of the brain, helping you orient, no pun intended, figure out where you are in your environment and what's salient, and then putting that out so that you can maintain consciousness. So if you've spent any time in your neurology section, you should know that the reticular activating system is responsible for consciousness. So it should be no surprise to you that delirium, which is an acute alteration or rapid fluctuation of consciousness, is due to an abnormality of the brain structure responsible for consciousness. So that's delirium in a nutshell, guys. This table is the high yield bottom line. The point of this question was to make you think that not all that hallucinates and acts psychotic is dopamine. And in many instances, it's going to be acetylcholine. So that's delirium. I hope that this question was helpful.